our next speaker um, is going to talk to us a little bit about the ways that we continuously interact now with our technology. Uh, she's the director of the Graphics Visualization and Usability Center at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And we're going to talk a little bit, I understand this afternoon, about human convergence or what some of the surprising outcomes may be when personal creativity meets up with technological innovation. So I encourage you to please welcome Beth Mayonette. That's quite the welcome, thank you. <laughs> so my name is Beth and I'm a recovering technologist. <laughs> I have a bachelor's, master's in and PhD in computer science. But more to the point, I've been raised in the world in the ethos of technology supremacy. This is a pretty easy worldview to understand. There's a long history of inventions that have profoundly shaped our daily existence. However, there is a longer list of inventions that have had little effect. Either ideas too good to be true, products that were destined for commercial success until they didn't, or gadgets that simply fell on deaf ears. So if your job, profession, or hobby is the same as mine, and you want to change the world through inventing technology, the question remains, what is the secret sauce? What is the secret to invention so that you can profoundly change the world as it moves forward? What I've been surprised by is that the secret to all of this is the magic of dancing. Because despite appearances, technology does not zoom through blowing away the old and bringing through the new. No, technology actually partners with people. It partners with us. It may lead forward and we can follow. We can push back. It may create a space for us to dazzle and to shine. It works with us and the secret of design, the secret of invention, is the dance. Now, as someone who was born essentially with two left feet, I had a long way to go to learn this lesson. And I'd like to tell you about some of those lessons that I've learned along the way. Back in the 1990s, uh, I was doing my dissertation work in computer science, and we were, were working on a project to translate graphical user interfaces into something that would be accessible for a blind computer user. Now, this may seem odd at first, but it wasn't that long ago that information on the screen, computer interfaces, were simply lines of text, those nice glowing green terminals. And it wasn't that difficult for a speech synthesizer or a braille display to present that information to a blind computer user. However, once computer screens became transformed into pixelated pictures of trash cans and icons and file folders and all of this information, suddenly all of that was inaccessible to blind computer users and if someone didn't invent something, a viable profession, very attractive pr profession for these people was going to be lost. So we set out to work on this project and there were many, many technical hurdles to understanding how you could try to understand everything that was on the screen, everything that was going on, and how to capture that information and present that to another person. However, the crux of the work that we were doing what it turned out to be really about was how you would understand something that was so visually rich and you wanted to make that information just as rich, just as productive for someone who couldn't see it. So at this point I need to tell you about Gary. Gary was a uh, person, he had been blind since early childhood and he was a well-trained scientist and engineer working at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. And Gary uh, was a perfect partner for working with us on this project. And because NASA was sponsoring our work in uh, 1992, he traveled to Georgia Tech to work with us on our team um, and to review our system design. Now, as you can imagine, when architects get together, they use blueprints to talk about their ideas back and forth. Well, when computer scientists, computer programmers get together, we use system diagrams. And a system diagram would have pictures of processes, data sources, servers, all of this information uh, flowing through on the diagram. And we realized as we were preparing for Gary's visit 
that we faced exactly the same problem. How would we take this visually rich information and present it to Gary as part of our discussions? So I did a little bit of research and I found a piece, uh, type of paper called tactile paper. And if you took special markers and you wrote over and over and over on it, an imprint would begin to emerge. And so armed with my tactile paper, I went over to the Center for the Visually Impaired in town and I asked if I could borrow their braille labeler. This is one of those Dyna labelers, you know, where you turn the dial and you press out the letters, except in this case it printed braille labelers. So um, I talked to the staff and they said no. They said a blind person would never ever be able to use such a diagram. I was wasting their time, I was wasting my time, and apparently I wanted to waste their labeler. <laughs> so at that point time stood still and there was just this twinge in my gut from working in this project and I very politely, a uh, southern girl that I am, very politely thanked them for their advice and asked them if I could borrow their labeler anyway. So the next morning we come to the meeting and I hand Gary uh, his diagram and, and the discussion proceeds for two hours in the room as we discuss our system. His hands never left the diagram. As we talked about the different system components, as he asked questions, as everything, ra uh, the discussions ranged across the room. His hands were constantly in motion, always on the focus of what we were talking about. The meeting went quite well, and as he was packing up his things uh, to head back home, I finally had the courage to ask him what he thought of this homegrown diagram. And his, he stopped for a second, and his voice kind of shook a little when he talked. And he said he wanted to take it home to show his colleagues. Because in his entire career, no one had ever taken the time, no one had ever reached out to close that gap to make him an equal partner in the discussions. So lesson number one, train your intuition. Learn what people want to do, learn what people can do, and then design the dance, design your technology to allow them to do that. So now I want to tell you about another project. I was uh, working with a uh, student, Jim Rowan. I was now a professor, but I still had a lot to learn. And I was working with the student, Jim Rowan, on a uh, set of projects for aging in place. And what I mean by that is we were designing technologies in the home that would enable the uh, independence and quality of life of an older adult living by themselves, as opposed to having to move to a, an in institutional uh, retirement assistive care center. And so we set about to train our intuition. We talked to older adults, we talked to their families, we talked to chaplains, we visited retirement homes. And what we began to hear was less about the older adult, but it was more about their adult children who were starting to assume responsibility for taking care of them. And what those children told us was that they didn't live with their parents, they didn't live next door, they didn't live on the same street, they didn't live in the same town separated by time and distance, they were constantly concerned they needed to know whether their mom or their dad was having a good day. They needed to know if they were okay. And those concerns, magnified by perhaps disease or illness or the death of another parent, left them feeling helpless. So we set out to design a system that would bring two families closer together, that would connect two homes. Uh, we were designing for peace of mind. What kind of information could we take from one home and bring it into another to pull those family connections together? Now there are many lessons in this project about what we did not do. We did not, for example, install video surveillance systems so that someone could look on a video signal about what their mom was up to. Trust me, no one wants that, <laughs> especially your mother. But we paid attention to what technology could do. And one of the things it could do is that we could use motion sensors, like what you have in a, video, in a uh, uh, security system. We could use motion sensors in the home and we could distribute them throughout the home and we could have a pretty good idea of where someone was in the home and when that happened, but we wouldn't try to guess why or what they were doing. But we could create a bit of a pulse, a bit of a blueprint of what was going on in the home. Now we were careful not to be judgmental about it, so we didn't worry about midnight raids through the refrigerator or sleeping in late on a Sunday morning. But what we could do, because people are habitual, 
was start to give a picture of what was going on in the home to give the, just that feeling of, was my mom or dad having a normal day? Was this a typical day for them? So we designed a system called the Digital Family Portrait. And what it was was just a regular picture of a family member, but surrounding it would be uh, visualizations, little graphic pictures of butterflies. Very simply, the more activity in the home, the bigger the butterfly. The less activity, the smaller the butterfly. And because we had a frame to work with, there were 28 butterflies available. And if you wanted to get more information about a particular day, it was touch sensitive, so you could just go touch that butterfly and see more details. So now I need to tell you about two more people. I need to tell you about Mary and Craig. Um, Mary uh, was in her 80s. She uh, was, was quite healthy uh, and lived independently. Her husband had passed away a few years back. But nevertheless, her children, who were scattered throughout the country, were worried about her living by herself. So Craig, uh, her son who lived closest to her, um, had found out about our work at Georgia Tech, and he had asked if he could try out the digital family portrait for him and his mom. So we worked with him for over a year on this project. So we went to Mary's home, we installed the sensors, and then the portrait uh, hung in Craig's home. So I want to tell you two stories from our work with them. Um, one day, Craig comes back from work, and uh, he looks at the butterfly, and it's just, it's huge. It's like it's breaking the boundary of what makes sense for the design. Uh, something's clearly going on. So what does Craig not do? He does not call up his mom and say, hey mom, remember that Georgia Tech monitoring system we put in your home? Well, it's telling me that you're up to something, so what gives? Now, Craig knew his mom much better than that. So he called up his mom and said, wow, mom, I've had such a busy day at work. How are you doing? At this point, Mary says, oh, I've had the best day. I finally got around to painting the hallway, and I've gotten all the pictures down, and I've got the primer on, and I should be done by the end of the day. At this point, Craig laughs, and he says, you must be walking back and forth between two of the sensors. You won't imagine what it looks like from over here. So second story, at the end, towards the end of the study, we went to interview Mary. And to be honest, Mary seemed to get healthier and healthier every single day of the study. And we were worried that she must resent any invasion into her home of her privacy. And so we weren't quite sure what she really thought about all this, because you know her son, Craig, this had been his idea. And so we went to talk to her about what she thought of the system. And she looked at us and she says, I really, I really enjoy doing this. I really like it. It makes me feel less lonely. Less lonely? Now remember, the sensors are hidden in Mary's house, and there's a, a, a computer that we tucked in her hallway closet. But the picture, it's over in Craig's house. Less lonely? And she explained, she says, there are days that go by where I don't see another human being. I don't talk to anyone else. I'm in the, you know, at home, I'm doing my own thing. But even if I don't talk to Craig, I know there's this connection between us. I know that he's there, that he knows a bit about what's going on with me in my home. And because of that connection, I feel less lonely. So lesson number two, leave space in your design for the dance. Leave space for the users, the people that you're working with, to finish your invention. Craig and Mary were an intricate part of the design. They filled it with their relationship, with their knowledge of each other. And the, the two of them, plus the portrait, completed the design and became the magic of the dance. So third story. I was working on a project uh, to support people with diabetes. And I was working with another student, Lena Mamakina. And so by now we felt we, we, you know, we had an idea about how to do this. So we went and we talked to people newly diagnosed with diabetes. We talked to physicians. We talked to uh, diabetes counselors. We attended support groups. Uh, we worked to train our intuition to understand uh, you know, what was happening in their lives. And what we heard again now over and over, because we start, you know, started to, to understand uh, how this worked, what we heard from them was that even if they wanted to follow their doctor's advice, even if uh, you know, they wanted to follow uh, what they were supposed to do, they nevertheless faced a myriad of decisions that they had to make each and every day. What to eat for breakfast, when should they eat breakfast, what could they eat at their favorite restaurant, what brand of soup should they buy, um, what could they get away with, and could they still have orange juice at breakfast because they really liked that. And even though they had all these questions, when they would go to see their doctor or when they would um, go to a support class, 
the questions would become generic, like well, what should I eat? Or the questions would just be forgotten. So we set to design a mobile device to help them capture all of those questions as they occurred in the moments of their lives. Um, they could take pictures, they could uh, leave voice notes, anything and everything they wanted to do to say, this is what I'm struggling with. And they did, I'll tell you. They took pictures of things that were healthy. Um, they took pictures of things that weren't so healthy. <laughs> they took pictures of confusing food labels. They took pictures of uh, blood sugar readings uh, that alarmed them. And all of this information went into a, a secure website where their diabetes educator, Trish, could log in uh, one, uh, once or twice a day, and she could begin to respond to their questions, to respond to their frustration. And it was on this website that the magic of the dance began to happen. Because what they would do is one person would post and say, uh, you know, I just woke up this morning and my sugar level is so high, all I've been doing is sleeping, you know, in frustration, what is going on? And Trish would say, well, what did you have for a late night snack? And they would say, what late night snack? And she would say, well, while you're sleeping, your body produces insulin, and one of the ways to keep it under control is to eat something before you go to bed. And they say, okay, fine, I'll do that. And the next morning they would post and they would be in frustration, you know, it's just as bad as before. And so Trish would say, well, what did you eat? Um, candy bar. Trish would say, mm, maybe not a candy bar, let's try a yogurt next time. And over the weeks as the people used the system, small victories began to occur. They figured out the late night snack. They figured out what to eat for breakfast. They figured out why they felt worse after sleeping late on weekend mornings as opposed to weekday mornings. They figured out what food worked for them at their favorite restaurant. And they figured out what things they wanted to buy at the grocery store. And with each victory, they became more self-confident. Their confidence increased that they could continue to make this work for them, that they could handle this and they weren't helpless as they had felt before. And what happened in this case was that the technology allowed the space for these people to come together and they were able to forge a new dance in their lives um, with the advent of this technology and with them grappling with this new disease, diabetes. So at the end of the study, we again went to talk to folks and because we wanted to interview them to see how they would explain this system to someone else, to a friend because that's a great way to, to figure out training. If, if someone explains, well, this is how I did it to someone who would be sitting next door to them, then, then you could use those same sorts of advice. And so we want, you know, there was the smartphone, there were the pictures, there was the security system, there was Trish, you know, how would, how would they explain all of this? And so we asked them to describe, you know, the whole system and they kind of looked at us with a funny look in their eye and they said, I was just talking to Trish because when the magic occurs, when the dance occurs, the technology disappears. Lesson number three. So when you put all of this together, my message to you today is that if you want to invent technology to change the world, if you want to invent technology to change people's lives, well, you better learn how to dance. You better learn to understand your partner you better give them space for them to shine. And when it's all said and done, the dance will be theirs. And when that happens, you will have been successful. Thank you very much.